there's always controversy around shooting does and you know i've gone through a lot of different scenarios where i've shot a lot of does in a season i think personally seven or eight is the most i've shot uh five and then a lot of times one two three and then there's a lot of years i haven't shot any and i've had the same beliefs all along the way that you're really i'm hunting bucks you know does do the same thing every day they have very short daylight movements and so i shoot does i hunt bucks if there's if you can see the difference there. i love the strategy of trying to shoot an older buck or just the oldest buck in the area or one of the oldest bucks in the area i like trying to do that you know right now i could have filled my tag in minnesota for gun or muzzleloader several times on four-year-old bucks different bucks they're mature bucks but we have a couple older and so i'm willing to get to the end of the season i've already had a good year and i'm willing to go to the end of the season we're going out this afternoon dylan and i there's about one or two bucks that i'm hoping to see the rest get a pass and that's okay with me i don't have to fill the tag but i can guarantee tonight i'd be able to shoot a doe if i wanted so i shoot does to manage the herd if the population's over i shoot them because I've seen the extreme where I've been in the UP of Michigan, 50% of all fawns die in an average winter in the UP of Michigan. Think about that, 50%, it's an average of 50,000 fawns per year. In a harsh winter, 90% of all fawns die and 50% of yearling deer. A yearling is not a fawn, a yearling is a year and a half old. So think about that. You can wipe out almost an age class with a heavy winter up there and that's happened. I think it was winters in 95 to 97, they lost 350 thousand total deer so in an area like that i started coming up in qdma and following the qdma principles bought property in 99 built that property wrote about it in 2004 is my first article it's actually on a it's actually framed right over there uh, behind dylan where we're filming but i i talked about in that article had, how i hadn't shot a doe and, and that was still qdma in fact they gave me the qdma deer manager of the year award in 2004 and i hadn't shot a doe in five years on that land because you're in herd building mode in an area like that, it's so different. Um, they get a trap out in the deer yards and over 20%, 20% of does that they trapped out in the deer yard were 10 years of age or older, which is crazy. But you need those older does for the sustainability of the herd in areas like that. So I've been, a, I started cutting my teeth in the thumb area of Michigan in the 80s, mid to late 80s, where there was over 50 deer per square mile. I mean, that was shoot every doe you see totally different philosophy and then I go up to the UP of Michigan and there's a lot of times where I've sat out in the, the swamps on opening day of gun season I've seen very little doe out there very few in fact I've seen way more bucks than does so I've seen both ends of the spectrum where you should shoot does you shouldn't shoot does you should build your herd but bottom line is and you can almost skip down to number two right here is just because you have a doe tag does not mean it's appropriate responsible to shoot a doe you have to use a little thought just because the DNR gives you a tag. They can't go to your XYZ land, public land or private, and say you need to shoot does on this land or you need to not shoot does. No one's going to hold your hand. But I see a lot of people that shoot does and then complain that the DNR somehow lowered the deer numbers the next year and they're having a crappy season. They have no one to blame but themselves. I've seen people do that up in the UP of Michigan where you have five deer per square mile or less and someone shooting a couple does in a bait pile behind their cabin in a very remote wilderness area. Literally, there's sections of land up there that don't have deer because they're still void of deer from those big winter loss days 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They're not replenishing. Until an area gets overpopulated, you're not gonna have deer move in, and that's a fact. So here they wipe out their only does in the area, and, uh, and then they complain about the deer numbers. They're not there, the wolves, they blame it on sugar beaters. People coming from out downstate and going to a cabin and, and when really just shooting a couple does in that in an area like that can be the deer herd of sustainability for the next few years to come. So there's a lot to think about when it comes to shooting does and I wanted to cover this topic but again just because you have a tag doesn't mean it's responsible or appropriate to shoot a doe and that's really really important to understand that. When not to shoot does you know start we'll start off with uh, number one here most big wood settings most wilderness settings that don't have ag, that don't have high quality cover, that are in more northern regions, are not going to have big deer herds. You're talking 10, 15 deer per square mile. In those areas, really think twice about shooting a doe. And, you know, look around, you look, do we have high deer numbers? If you don't, don't shoot a doe. If you have high deer numbers, shoot does. And what's a high deer number? Well, it could be that you're, and I like watching trends. So let's say you've been hunting in an area for five or 10 years, you see the deer numbers are two, three times what they were, well, shoot some does. 
if you think there's too many. Um, if they're lower than they were five years ago, maybe let the population go back up. But you have a lot of, you know, a lot of ability to practice trigger, trigger control in an area like that to raise or lower population, especially where there's not a lot of deer in each time you pull a trigger can be a drastic consequence that follows, or if you don't, you know, and, and usually when you need to lower deer numbers, you're not talking about just shooting one doe. You're talking about shooting several. One doe typically doesn't make a difference in an area except in extreme circumstances. But most wilderness, big wood areas, and this really applies to public land. A lot of areas in public land and extreme wilderness big woods areas. Now I'll think of like uh, in areas where you can bait. You can draw deer from miles away. Uh, maybe yarding uh, migration areas where deer move 15, 20 miles like in the UP of Michigan, northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, upstate New York. Areas where deer move a long ways to find winter cover and they stay there all year. Well if you're hunting an area where lots of deer are passing through, you're making a decision to shoot deer and, and it looks like there's a lot of does but those does are funneling down from huge giant vast areas of not a lot of deer. So you have to think about those just because you have a doe tag. I don't like states where they have, they'll take an entire state and with your gun license, you get two doe tags automatically for every area. And that's really irresponsible because not every year, I would, I would estimate when I go to client properties and I'll visit about 100 this year, 80, 110 last year, 105, 125 the year before, I would say probably, and Dylan, I want your opinion on this too, but I would say about, uh, Third of all properties I go to need to shoot a lot more does, a lot more. Um, I agree with that. And they're, and they're not, they have trouble often because here they have these big expensive properties. They do a lot of work, put a lot of time into it, and they hunt primarily by themselves. They don't have enough tags. They don't have enough time. So some people have the ability to shoot a lot of does, some people don't. Um, and I'd say about a third of properties don't need to shoot any does. Yeah. They're in herd building mode. Yeah. They, they don't have good habitat. They haven't had good hunting practices. There's not a deer on the property. And then about a third, if they shoot a doe or two or not, not a big deal. You know, it's not gonna have any negative, positive impact either way. So you get, you get some for some meat. That's kind of how I look at it. And, and I think you could apply that to most areas in the country, except for when you get on public land, even less likely that you should be shooting a doe if you care about the deer numbers in that area. At least, again, shooting one or two does in a big, big, vast area probably is gonna make a big, big difference. but. Um, so most public lands, big woods, wilderness areas, think about that. Again, tags lie. Just because you have a tag doesn't need, mean you need to shoot does. Just because you don't have a tag doesn't need, mean you don't need to shoot does. Find someone else that has tags. You might need to find more tags. It might not give you enough. And again, that's not the DNR's fault or state's fault. That's just they can't go down and micromanage every 40 acre parcel in the entire country, entire state. Timing. This is critical, even if you need to shoot does. And some of these are random thoughts, not necessarily in order. But think about timing of shooting does. If you're shooting does on opening day of gun season, you have no one to blame but yourself if you don't see bucks or the kind of bucks you want after opening day of gun season. Unless you have a buck on the ground, I would not shoot a doe on opening day of gun season. See, think about the beginning of the season. Then you look at it like this. I draw this all the time. You have the beginning of the season right here. You have the end of the season right here. When, when you could shoot does, you know, this is the beginning right here. Let's say this is 10-1. Uh, this is 12 or 1-1, one, one, January 1st. And you have this timeline right here. Well, this is a great time to shoot does. Beginning to the end of the season, all the way until you get to this middle point right here, which is gun season, you know, November 15th in Michigan. After that point, that opportunity increases. So think about this is the most sacred time of the year spiraling outward. That's when you have to be very careful when you're shooting does because every decision you make bumps deer off your land. We have a 30 acre parcel in Wisconsin, we hunt a lot. When I shoot a doe there, I wanna make sure that's at a time where I'm not affecting the buck hunt because again, we can go out and shoot does anytime we want. I'm not going to do it at a time when I'm sacrificing the lowest hole in the bucket, which is the oldest buck age class in the area. They're independent thinkers, they act differently. Same intelligence levels, but they think and act as a sole deer. They made decisions that have kept them alive for a long time. Those older bucks, does think herd mentality. They do and think and act. They don't move very far during the day. They move from bedding to feeding, and then after night, you know, after dark, who cares where they go? But I always have that lowest hole in the bucket of bucks, and I talk about that all the time because it's a whole lot harder for us to say, okay, we're gonna go out and shoot a five-year-old buck tonight. I could go say and almost pick the age, we're gonna go shoot a four to six year old doe tonight. 
And we can do that even not without a lot of doe numbers on the property because they do the same thing every day. We see their tracks, we see the sign, we see them from stands. We know what they're doing, pretty easy. So think when you're shooting a doe, how it's affecting the rest of your goals because a few does, I always bring up the, the example of a client of mine that shot five does one year on opening day, three does the next, and then they wonder where the deer are at during gun season in Wisconsin and the after, you know, later on in the season. In fact, it affected, affected the, year, the numbers for the third and fourth years after that because they're in more of a wilderness area without ag, and they really slaughtered some does, and it affected their hunt. It affected their numbers for later. Really bad decision to shoot on opening day unless you need to shoot them. You have a buck down, you already have to go in there and get it anyways, that's a great opportunity, even during the rut. You might, you know, sacred time, but you just shot a buck, you need to go in and get it anyways, might as well shoot a doe. Done that before, it's enjoyable. Bad habitat practices. What I mean by this is, if you have, someone's just making a comment on YouTube this morning, they talked about, they have, let's say a 300 acre parcel, and 220 in hardwoods, and then they have an 80 acre hay field. All they're seeing are a bunch of does. Well, they don't have great cover, they don't have fall food sources, and they have the perfect summer food source of a bunch of hay, where it pulls in does and fawns from all around to feed in that hay field. They probably professionally manicure it, cut it, cut it three times a year, four times a year, whatever it takes. And they, they supply their property with a lot of does and fawns, but there's, not, there's really nothing left over for bucks. No buck cover, no buck food during the fall, and bucks will travel a great distance during the fall to find food. You can't build a good quality herd with just TSI, timber stain improvement on your property and great habitat improvement. You have to have food. And food comes more in the form of just hardwood regeneration, mass crop, fruit crops. It comes in the form, if you have private land, of high quality food plots. You have to have food plots on private land. If you don't, someone puts it in a mile away, they're gonna take all your deer. And it doesn't take much because a lot of people plant food plots these days. You wonder where the deer go this fall? Where are they at? Well, they're priced a mile away on food, especially those mature bucks. They'll travel great distances to find food, especially if it's unpressured, and especially if it's adjacent to good habitat. So it's a twofold thing. You need, you need hardwood regeneration, shrub tips, briars. You need browse that browse class. I consider acorns browse. They're not enough of a food source to drive a deer herd, to build a deer herd, to build sex ratios, adequate buck age structure, but it is a food source similar to briars, woody shrub tips, hardwood regeneration. You have to have that, and then you have to have that quality food component. Now, that hardwood regeneration, briars, woody shrub tips, that becomes the major food source on public land. The difference between private and public land when it comes to that. And so in an area on public land, you're wondering where the bucks are, wondering where the mature bucks are, find diversity, find upland cover, find clear cuts, and you'll find those bucks because again, if it's unpressured, if it's remote, that's where bucks gravitate to and it's no different on private land. The only difference is they'll gravitate to food plots. And ag land doesn't count. Ag land is actually a lower value than hardwood regeneration, briars, woody shrub tips because ag land or all around here, we have our frosted out alfalfa that's yellow and we have all our cornfields plowed down to the ground. So there's nothing out in those ag fields for them at all. You can get a little browse from the, from the uh, yellow alfalfa that's very low in, in nutritional con content right now in attraction. And so if you don't have that food plots, those deer are gone. Around here, if we didn't have food plots for a mile away or more, then we might be able to get away with having just good TSI. But even then, that's food everywhere in the woods. So there's no defined travel through there. Easy ways to shoot deer, to create pinch points. If all your if your 40 acres is a clear cut, where are they gonna be? You can't even walk on the property without potential spooking deer because nothing's different. There's no edge. Bad habitat practices. Again, going back to number one, I see where it builds a lot of does and fawns is you have great summer food and you pull in those does and fawns. They, does and fawns that are here today are here to stay. They stick around and there's simply no room left over for mature bucks. And let's face it, if you didn't have that summer food and it was all just wasteland, you wouldn't have those mature bucks in that situation either because there's no reason for them to be on your property during the fall if you don't have that fall food source. So be very careful planting summer food. I see a lot of people that plant so much in summer food, they're battling forever this problem with too many does on their land when the first thing you should do is get rid of the summer food. That's gonna be a far more effective at controlling doe numbers and fawn numbers and keeping those deer on your summer that bleed into the fall and into the winter that's gonna be far more effective at reducing those numbers than trying trigger control. 
Trigger control disturbs the land. You have to go in there every time. It takes multiple people, multiple tags, especially if you have overwhelming doe numbers. So be very careful of planting too much summer food because the carryover into fall can have drastic consequences to your buck age structure, your sex ratios, and ultimately the number of the bucks that you have on your land because there's simply not enough room left over. The stewardship comes up all the time. I even saw a post the other day that kind of bothered me because people talk about, I'm doing my part. I'm a conservation, I'm a, I'm a steward of the land because I take a doe. Take a doe because you're a steward. I wanna know the whole story because just because you shoot a doe doesn't mean you're a steward. In fact, it could be the opposite. You're being irresponsible with the land. There's people that need to shoot does, there's people that don't. If you're in a category where you shouldn't be shooting does and you do, don't tell anyone you're a steward. Don't pat yourself on the back. In fact, you lowered deer numbers, you're hurting your hunt, you're not reaching the, the herd potential of your area, your herd building opportunity. And I know people that have you know million dollar properties, several hundred acres, and they shoot a few does a year. What a waste. How about just you know, lease some land, 40 acres here, shoot a couple does. You don't have the million dollar investment into that land. If you have 300 acres and you're in a good ag area, you should be shooting mature bucks every single year. And you're shooting does to help manage and balance the herd when needed. But just because you shoot three does on your land or four does on your land and that's it for the year, you're woefully underperforming with the amount of resources that you have at your fingertips, no matter how much work you're doing, no matter how many native grass fields you plant, food plots you plant. Raise your expectations because if you have a good herd, you'll have a good hunt. If you have a good hunt, you're gonna have a good herd. You can't have the two without combining them. You can't have one without the other. So stewards of the land, being a conservationist, doesn't fall into a category. Just because I shoot a mature buck doesn't mean I'm, I'm a conservationist or I'm a steward. Just because I plant switchgrass doesn't mean I'm a steward because if it doesn't relate to, there's a lot. We just drove by fields today. We drove down to Rushford, an area town nearby. We go through a lot of empty pheasant habitat fields that can't hold barely a mouse during the winter time because there's no, there's no grass standing in there or shrubs to actually hold and protect deer. Those people that have those hundreds of acres of planted near us are not being stewards of the land. Just because you have birds and butterflies and bees during the summertime isn't a good use of the land because you can have all of it together. You could have solid patches of switchgrass that actually provide cover during the year. You could have shrubs in there. You can have the birds and butterflies and bees with pollinator blends. That's what we do, that's what I teach. But we can drive by dozens of acres and hundreds of acres depending on the field. There's just a solid wasteland now that we have six, eight inches of snow and you can see through it. Nothing can live there and cover just because you planted some cool mix by XYZ organization does not make you a steward of the land. You wanna change your sex ratios in age structure? You do that by what you plant, the habitat that you have first. When you actually reshape things, so let's say you have too much summer food, get rid of the summer food, increase the fall food, increase the fall and winter habitat. Now you change your whole sex ratios and age structure because you attract more bucks to the land, because you have more cover and fall food. You can advance those bucks in the next age class because you're keeping them from being shot by someone else. You have fewer does to shoot, so you're not invading the property all the time because you got rid of your summer herd that is transferring into the fall herd. So just by making some habitat changes, some timing of when you plant food, you can drastically alter the, alter the buck age structure and sex ratios, and I haven't even talked about shooting does. You do that by changing the habitat. That's what you do first. That's why I get down here, trigger control, not the first option. That's the option when either things go really well because you have obvious resonant doe numbers and you've increased the habitat for fall, winter, fall food, you are gonna increase your doe numbers. You'd eventually have to shoot them. But if you're combining a huge summer habitat base for those fawning does that come back to the same spot and stay in the same spot every single year through the fall, then you're just exacerbating the problem. A lot of times, the typical high quality ag area property would shoot does every few years in bunches, not bunches every year. If you're shooting bunches of does every year, you're doing something wrong. That probably means you have too much summer food. And I granted there's areas that have summer food all around and so, but it, even then, then your property shouldn't be different than everywhere else. So if you have area numbers that are really high, then you're gonna have high deer numbers, but you shouldn't be the only one with high deer numbers unless you're doing something wrong because there's that ag and summer food source ag spread everywhere. So 
Change in sex ratios, change in buck age structure can be done just with habitat choices of when and timing, timing of food plots and making sure that you have fall winter habitat. Then you compartmentalize deer more, you can fit more deer on one parcel safely because you have the daytime browse, you have that early successional growth that allows you to attract deer and hold them on your land. And again, trigger, trigger control. It shouldn't be your first option. In fact, if you manage your habitat correctly, then you probably won't have to shoot a lot of does. Again, it'll be in bunches every two years, three years, every other year, um, not every single year throughout the entire season. Number eight, let's just talk about earn a buck. People say, well, you should have to shoot it. I saw someone on a general Michigan forum just saying, anywhere in Michigan to get a buck tag, you should have to shoot a doe. Horrible advice, because again, it goes back to a third of all just regular good private land shouldn't be shooting does, let alone public land. So you take all those public land areas, you wanna decimate the numbers on public land to where you don't even have a deer herd to shoot in some areas? Practice earn a buck. But that being said, you know that it's not appropriate for most areas in a given state. The second thing is earn a buck, I, I wanna say it was 32% of the harvest, 29%, 32%, I know it's around 30%, I know the exact number, it's 29 to 32%, Dylan, do you I remember? Right around there. Yeah. But it's um, of the harvest are button bucks. You're trying to earn a buck by shooting a doe, doe to build and earn a buck tag, but you're shooting a button buck to do so. And I, I've even seen cases, right, a friend of mine, um, I only mention his name, but um, he was in an area where he sat 10 times before he had a buck to shoot, you know, or a doe to shoot to earn his buck tag. So he's sitting there hunting this land 10 times, finally shoots one, it's a button buck. Now I can't say he consciously made the decision to shoot a button buck, but the point is, is that in his area, in that land that was right next to ours that he hunted, he took a long time to be able to see a doe because of the conditions in that area where it was just all open hardwoods, no summer food source, no food plots, no good cover. And so in that case, he passed up a bunch of bucks before he even saw a doe to shoot, where we had in that, that property next door, it was right around that time where we shot 12 does in one year. So we're shooting these does over here because we have good habitat, we had that, and people around us weren't, and then so we shot them. And then over here on a property next door, it's a completely different situation. So you can have, just because you need to shoot does on one property doesn't mean you need to on the adjacent property. And that's where earn a buck is a very, very bad choice. It's a necessary evil at times they found, but, but really not very often. Number nine, obvious resident deer numbers, doe numbers. And what I mean by that is when you do well with your habitat and you do well, when you should shoot does, you see this group of eight, 10, 12 does all the time in this area. They're there in October, they're there in November, they're there in December. And you start thinking if you, if you really extrapolate that out, this is a lot of deer in the area. And, and maybe they're just in one area. But really consider when you're shooting and when you're looking at this group of does that are coming out all the time, you might want to shoot four or five of them because they're just going to have fawns. They'll build back up the next year. And I know areas where they, they like watching these 10, 12, 15 does and fawns out their window, but they're just building these deer numbers. These deer numbers, you're building this giant machine that puts away bucks. Every time you go outside, you spook deer. When you go in the woods, you spook deer. You're alerting deer on the property every time you go out, in and out then. And cool, they're fun to watch. I love watching does and fawns, but you have to manage the numbers. So when you're seeing these obvious consistent numbers throughout the entire season, and I say consistent throughout the entire season because you have to be very mindful. If you have great habitat, winter habitat, fall winter habitat, and you start seeing large numbers in December, you can't go by those numbers and making the decision that you have to shoot does. If you're seeing big groups in December, what if yours is the best parcel within two miles around and you're attracting all those does and fawns, 80% of the herd, 70% of the herd to your property because you have the best food and cover? You're shooting does from a giant area. You're thinking, okay, I'm seeing 19 does and fawns of here, through here. But you have to realize those might be from six square miles. So you're making a decision based on six square miles. You have to know that. You have to look outside of the box and outside of your property and make a decision that is actually practicing stewardship and making a smart decision, making a responsible and appropriate choice as opposed to just saying there's 19 does in the field, I need to shoot them. And that goes back to even the habitat. I've seen areas where the deer don't like white pines too much or spruce, so if they're eating them, there's obviously too many does. Folks, I've seen close to 30,000 conifers in a 40 acre field planting in lines. The entire top of them, half of that top of that conifer, these seedlings that were planted in rows, 
were eaten by about nine deer on trail camera over a two to three week period. They just went and nipped through all the tops and killed them. It was the only thing green sticking out of the snow. It didn't mean there was a lot of deer. It just meant that it was the only thing there and they came from a ways around. They camped out there for a couple weeks and ate all the tops. And that can happen next to food sources during the winter time where they're picking on white pines where they normally wouldn't otherwise. Uh, spruce, just because you plant spruce as a food plot edge and they get eaten, doesn't mean you have too many does. It means it's next to a food plot edge and they're going to get eaten because it's next to a major food source. They just, deer browsers, they'll go over and eat them. So it's really, I've, I've literally seen wildlife biologists go through and say, look, they should not be eating white pine or spruce. You have too many does during the summertime. They can see that browsing. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It was because it was a yarding area and those deer come from miles and miles and miles around to get to that location in the UP of Michigan, going back to 50,000 fawns dying an average winter, 50,000, you know, 50%, uh, 90% in a heavy winter. And when they go down to those yarding areas, those areas are browsed out green barns sometimes. And if we take out those, we take out those deer numbers, there's gonna be areas that don't even have a sustainable herd. So it's that serious. Number 10 down here with fawns. So you have does. Dylan brought this up too, because we get this asked a lot. I just had a question about this the other day on YouTube too, where you know, I, I want to take a doe, I have a lot of doe numbers, but all the does have fawns. Well, that's a good thing, because that means if they all have fawns, that means you have pretty mild winters. These does aren't aborting the fawns before the end of the winter because the winters are too severe and they can't handle two fawns. They're only handle one or none. So it means you have quality habitat too. It means you have, probably have thick habitat, high stem count where predators can't pick them off. You know, think about uh, Pennsylvania, they've done some studies where half of all fawns succumb to predation, but it's in open, big wilderness, uncut timber, where it's very open. There's no side cover, there's no stem count. So there's very, I mean, literally a hiding spot for a fawn is next to a log. Those coyotes can go through an area and find those fawns pretty easily. In fact, 50% of the time, bobcats, bears, and coyotes uh, get those fawns in those areas. But when you have high stem count, and that means you have probably good small game populations, those coyotes are not going to get a lot of fawns. Those predators aren't going to get a lot of fawns. And that's a good thing. And it also means that if you don't have winter severity and you have those good high fawn numbers, and you have good habitat, you can shoot those mothers and those fawns are just going to join other doe family groups and they're going to live. They're going to make it on their own. And so except for those extreme circumstances where those fawns need to be shown the way to the migration routes, they don't just know instinctually to go to the yards. They have to be taught that and taught to go to those deer yarding areas. Where I've seen some succumb to winter severity up there when the mother was gone is, I can think of a button buck sitting on a bait pile. Huge bait pile that was set out in November. The people leave, they go home, they're not back there. They just, it was a one-time thing to go up there hunting at their cabin during that time of the year. This button buck feeds happily on the remaining bait pile while all the other deer move to the deer yard. It sits there, sits there, all of a sudden the snows are deep. It doesn't know the way down to the deer yard. It's by itself and it succumbs to predators, predation, winter severity, whatever it might be. That's an extreme circumstance though. There's been some good studies where if the mother is around, the button buck will leave 90% of the time. If she's shot, he'll stay 70% of the time. I think those are the numbers. So when that mother's gone, good chance that button buck will stay around. But bottom line, they live. And they'll be able to withstand what winter can throw at them at the majority, 95% of all white tail areas, because very few areas, you know, we get a big storm in Indiana or Illinois, and people say, wow, we need to help the deer. No, it's going to melt in a week or less, two weeks, and those deer will be just fine. It's very, very rare that they come to, succumb to winter severity in 95% of the white tail range. So... Don't worry about shooting a doe that has fawns. Now, and, and you know, think about even age, what you're talking about with shooting does. You get up in those areas that are wilderness areas and winter severity areas, the worst doe you could shoot is a highly mature doe, you know, one that's three, four years old or older because winter severity can't kill them. Very few succumb to winter severity because they're big enough they're big enough, they're as big or bigger than year and a half old bucks, than all fawns, they can reach food and browse that other deer can't. So if you look at yarding area studies, very few mature does, let alone mature bucks, mature bucks almost rarely ever succumb to winter severity. So in an area like that, where you're looking at sustainability, sustainability of the herd, you're looking at shooting older, older does. When you're in an area 
where you just need to reduce numbers, you're looking at any and every doe to try to take. And when you're shooting older does in those areas, you're also reducing the overall experience level of does in a farmland area, and that's not a bad thing either. You know, those older does are gonna have more fawns. Those older does are wiser, more experienced, so they're not picking you out in tree stands as much. I'd rather the average doe in a private land area be three and a half years old, or four, not seven, because those are a bunch of wise does are running around that have probably seen you in every stand that you have at some point, and can pick you out and sit there and blow and blow and blow. So. There's some random thoughts kind of about shooting does, but there's a lot of people that need to shoot does. There's a lot of people that don't. Again, just because you have a tag doesn't mean you are responsible or that you're being a steward of the land by shooting a doe. It takes a lot more thought than that. And the cool thing is, you know, no one's grading you on this. You're just looking at, I just want you to make an informed decision. You know, think about your decision when you shoot a doe. Again, I hunt bucks, mature bucks. They're the lowest one in the bucket. There's not a lot of them around. So when I shoot one of those, you know, that's the goal of owning the property. And so if I don't own those properties, shoot a bunch of does, I can go to, I can go just about anywhere, lease land, and go find does to shoot. The public land, if I wanted to, and shoot does. They're around. But bottom line is, is that you need to make a decision that's informed. And you look at it and you say, you know what, I think I need to shoot some does. Well, if that's the decision, you put some thought into it. God bless you. You know, that's a good thing. You at least thought about it. But it doesn't result to just a tag. The DNR, the state, can't come out and help you manage your land on an individual basis like that. Put a little thought into it. And in the end, should you shoot does? I don't know. That's on you. That's on you to make that decision going forward to the end of the season when we have a lot of does that we could shoot, depending on the area, or not. And certainly for next year and beyond. And think about the whole picture of how you want your property to transform Think about sex ratios, adequate buck age, stru age structure, populations maintained in balance of the habitat. That's actually what the biological basis is of QDM. Not trophy management, just having balance. The balance in habitat, balance in deer. There's a lot of things that could actually improve by just applying a little balance. And certainly shooting does is one of those things. So good luck with your hunting. We still have a little bit left this year. And I hope this helps you make a decision for shooting does this year and beyond. Folks, I want to make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.